Good afternoon, Judy. Thank you so much for joining us today as we begin our celebration of the long history of Frank Porter Graham and supporting early childhood development and work with children and families. Given your amazing experiences and the work you do, we exactly have the right person. There's nobody better to help start us off. So thank you for being with us. I'd like to start by asking you if you would, some of us that are joining, some of the folks joining us today may not know the history of disability rights, about all the supporters, all the efforts, all the advocacy that brought us where we are. Would you mind starting off by telling us about what it was like from your earliest memories, what it was like when you, was, you were a child, what it was like for families, for adults with disabilities, and then through your lens of experiences, would you bring us a little bit forward from that? Sure. Uh, thank you, first of all, very much, Sharon, for inviting me to speak. I was really touched by the invitation. Uh, let me also say that when we talk about history, one thing that's very important is that no one person knows all of the history. And so I think one thing that's very important for those people that are listening to this program is begin to think not only about your personal history, but also who are some of the uh, makers for change in your communities who you maybe don't know, may no longer be living, but you've heard their name mentioned. It's really important, I think, to really delve down deeply about what's happened. And I'm 73 years old, so I'm sure I'm one of the older people participating in this event, and I had polio in 1949. And in 1949, my parents didn't know anything about disability, which for those of you who are parents, um, I'm sure you may know a little bit more today because there's so much more going on in the area of disability, but you really, most likely really don't have the experience of having a family member who's had a disability or a child a friend who's got a child with a disability. So you're kind of learning many things as you go along. And I think that was very true for my parents. In addition to the fact that there was no IDEA, there was no ADA, there was no 504, there really wasn't anything. And I had polio during an epidemic like what's going on with COVID. And my mother was pregnant with my brother. Um, I had polio in August and she had my brother in September. So it was quite a tumultuous time. And there was a doctor that recommended that my parents put me in an institution, which they chose not to do. So when I was five, my mom took me to school. It was in walking distance from our house. And I'm sure she expected nothing except that they teach me. But the school had steps. My mother pulled my wheelchair up the steps and the principal informed my mother that I couldn't go to that school. For that matter, I couldn't go to any school. And they sent a teacher from the Board of Education in New York City to my house. Principal said, don't worry, they'll send a teacher. And they did for two and a half hours a week. So I think many of you, uh, both family members and providers, I may remember the days or at least know more about stories of the days where children were just oh, outright refused. Um, and what my parents were really learning was that they needed to become advocates for me. And they did. They didn't know other families who had kids with disabilities. Um, and after I was denied the right to go to school, my mother then was trying to figure out what to do. And when I was in the middle of the fourth grade, having had two and a half hours a week of instruction for the first, second, third and half of the fourth grade, the Board of Ed in New York um, called my mom. I was on a waiting list and my mother brought me down to the school that I was going to be evaluated. And she had to drive me to and from school for the one week evaluation. I was evaluated by a PT and an OT and a speech therapist and a social worker and a doctor. And they could determine whether or not you got to go into the program. So I was accepted in the program. I was the first 
child who had polio to be accepted into the program. But I think one of the very important parts of what was going on during that period was I began to meet other disabled children, children with cerebral palsy and spina bifida and other forms of disabilities. And the other important aspect of this is so is my mother. My mother and my father were meeting other parents and they were able to talk to other parents about what the parents saw as barriers and what the parents' vision of what they wanted to have happen. I think that's really an important part of anything that we discuss, that much of the work which has been driven in this area has really been driven by parents and organizations that parents have helped set up over the years. And as parents' vision for their children has changed and where parents see um, the value of their children being integrated in society, I think that's also been one of the critical components of allowing more legislation to be developed, to be implemented, and at the state and local levels also to be uh, more demanding that the services being given really will uh, benefit children throughout the course of their life. And when looking at early childhood, I think what we've seen um, are many things. One is clearly knowing that early intervention, regardless of the significance of the child's disability, is critically important. It's not only critically important for the child, but again, I think it's critically important for the family because the family, you know, whether you have a child with a disability or not, it's really your responsibility to help instill within your child a future. And when the kid is one, two, three, four, five years old, we are really uh, implanting visions of whether or not we see a child with a disability as one who's going to be able to take their rightful place in society. Judy, it's such a remarkable history. And listening to you talk to us about it, I'm struck with when you were approved by the Senate to um, become the Assistant Secretary of OSERS in the early 90s. And the exciting part, and I do remember you, you at that time you chaired the Federal Interagency Coordinating Council. So in listening to you speak just now, I was thinking of the relationship between the families, adults with disabilities, the providers, the state and local agencies. Talk a little bit about the role you played in your leadership when you were in Washington at that in that position and how that helped further the efforts. Cause you're right, it was it was early 90s before it was a guarantee down to birth. Right. So um, when I was the assistant secretary in the Clinton administration from 1993 to 2001, um, the coordinating council that you're talking about was we, we met I think a couple of times a year mm -hmm. and it was made up of government agencies as well as organizations that had uh, an important role to play in the area of education for disabled early childhood, and including talking with Head Start and many other programs. What I thought was really valuable about it was that it brought these voices together. It allowed us to get data on what was happening and what wasn't happening, and to really look at ways that we could strengthen uh, both the delivery uh, from the federal to the state and local levels, also hear the voices of parents and what was working and not working. And I think, um, you know, one of the valuable parts about early childhood, uh, early childhood education is this very clear intent that there are multiple agencies that need to be involved, mm -hmm. that coordinated services is critical. I totally agree. And you heard from families at those council meetings. And then, as you said, you go, you went back to OSERS and under your leadership, a lot of mechanisms, for instance, technical assistance were available as states were developing these high quality programs for children and families. But you're right. Some of that was cross set cross collaboration with um, programs in health and human services. I'm a very strong believer in technical assistance. I think it's one one area that makes the United States unique. When I travel around the world, as I did when I worked 
for the World Bank and for the State Department. Uh, one thing that was noticeably absent in many countries was meaningful technical assistance. Ultimately, I believe that there are many people who want to do the right thing. They just don't know what to do. And they may not have learned about it in their training. Um, and therefore, their ability to really work as effectively as possible is hampered. So I really looked to the Early Childhood TA Center um, as one of the technical assistance programs that the Department of Education provides in the area of education as a critical tool to help ensure that people are getting the information they need to be able to provide comprehensive services. And I think one of the other very important parts about the TA Center is that it very much values the role of parents. And to me, the ultimate objective here is not only services for children, but also the empowerment of parents. Um, we know we've accomplished so much through leaders like yourself and the colleagues you work with. I thought the other day there was an anniversary or a birthday celebration for Justin Dart. So there's no end to the heroes and um, the history of, uh, of, the, of where the disability efforts are going. But we have a lot of work to still do, Judy. I know you'd be the first person to tell me that. And we know that states and communities are working hard to address any gaps in services to children and families. COVID has certainly exacerbated and put a kind of a bright light for us on the gaps we might have. Can you talk a little bit about your priorities or your um, current efforts that can help us make sure we have more equitable opportunities going forward? You know, so now I'm uh, just an ordinary person. I don't work in government, so I don't have uh, the influence over legislation, regulations, et cetera, like I did uh, when I was at OSERS at Ed the Department of Education. But for me, one of the areas that I do a lot of work on is really uh, communicating with a, a broad variety of people in the business community, in the nonprofit community, um, civil society more broadly, disabled and non-disabled people, because one, there, there are many, many barriers that still exist where disabled people still are not seen as equivalent members of society. And the adverse effect that poverty and race all too frequently play in this discussion. And so I, I believe that, you know, really what's important about this 50th anniversary is that we know what's possible. Mm -hmm. And we also know when there are barriers put up that really do not allow what is possible to happen. COVID obviously is something that has affected everyone. And so we're all scurrying as we're trying to catch up. And certainly for children with disabilities um, and their families, this can be even more challenging. And we understand that. And so I think it's more important to be vigilant to ensure that families are not left out to dry. They've got too much on their plate. And so we really have to commit ourselves to ensuring that disabled children um, are getting the same supports and some cases more in order for them to try to catch up. Because we know that we fought for early childhood because we know that when these services are not provided, there can be significant delays. And it's not just delays for disabled children but certainly it is significantly for some disabled children. So true. And we, we know what the challenge, we know the challenges, we know the difficulties and we know things are not happening the way they should everywhere. I guess we, we keep ourselves focused on that absolute given that we want, which is inclusive, equitable opportunities for all young children with disabilities and their families. Well, for all young children, particularly children with disabilities and their families. Judy, this is so helpful um, and we appreciate you joining us so much. I'm wondering as we're closing, is there anything else that you wanna share with us? Any advice to give us or anything else you wanna share to help us with our celebration? I think there's a lot to celebrate. Um, you know, we've really come so far uh, since I was a kid. 
but we have so much more to go. So I think what's important is we celebrate our successes. We're honest about where we are and we fight more vigilant than ever to really get to the end where we can feel assured that families, regardless of their first language or their economic status, or whether they live in an urban or rural area are gonna be able to get the types of assessments for their children. That we are really working in a system where people believe that inclusivity is something which is essential. And only in the rarest of situations are we looking at children not being included. And we need to be able to ensure that teachers are getting the training that they need to work in diverse classes. And ultimately in another five years, the 55th anniversary, we'll be able to see that we've come through COVID, that children in fact have received the services they need and that we are looking at this next generation really being able to benefit more significantly from education with better employment outcomes. Judy, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to accept that challenge from you. And I know we can continue to do that. And let's hope five years from now, we can have this conversation again and celebrate some more achievements. We really appreciate you being here today so much and best wishes. And you know, we follow all of your wonderful adventures and all of the things you continue to contribute to our field. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much.